is a Zangpola and welcome to the inaugural Chase Tabula podcast series, Chase Tabula Cast Talk Beyond the Books. I'm your host, Lexang Pakilalaki, from the class of 2024, and with me we have two enthusiastic senior students, Ms. Sangye Wangmo and Ms. Tashi Wangmo, who are here with us to discuss an important aspect of our constitutional framework, the impeachment process. But before we delve into our discussion, let us take a moment to acknowledge and appreciate the significance of this day. Today, as we celebrate the 68th birth anniversary of His Majesty the Great Fourth, Trigal Shippa, we also honor the very spirit of the name of our law school, which has its roots in the great legacy of His Majesty. Moreover, today we also commemorate Constitution Day, marking the 15th anniversary since the adoption of the Constitution of Bhutan, which is the foundational document that has shaped its governance since 2008. Today, the JSW Law Research Center is extremely pleased and excited to launch its first ever legal podcast series. This series is expected to discuss and critically analyze legal issues that have a larger impact on democracy, constitutionalism, and the rule of law. Before we delve into the main topic for today, the impeachment process, let us begin by understanding our constitution and its historical context. Uh, so could either one of you briefly give us an overview of the constitution and its historical significance? Right, so um, it is not unknown that the national constitution is the most valued document. And likewise, the constitution of Bhutan is one of the most prized possessions which holds a great significance capturing the collective people's hope to protect the sovereignty and the national identity of the country. I believe that the constitution is an embodiment of these aspirations, and I think that it plays a crucial role in the political culture as well as the historical legacy. Um, I still remember that line from the book Principles and Philosophies of the Constitution of Bhutan, penned by our former Chief Justice M. Tokke wherein he stated, and I quote, the constitution of Bhutan, unlike many other constitution, is a product of peace, you know, with the purest of motives. And I think that this statement alone says a lot about the essence of our constitution. So let me just take you back to the year 2008, during our adoption of our constitution. His Majesty, during that time, he explained the principles and philosophies of this document. And uh, speaking about this, before I was preparing for this podcast, I stumbled upon His Majesty's quote. And I think that right now, this is the best time to read this uh, quote out, as I think it is relevant to this question. So let me just read this out. And I quote, This constitution is the most profound achievement of generations of endeavor and service. As it is granted to us today, we must remember that even more important than the wise and judicious use of powers it confers, is the unconditional fulfillment of the responsibilities we must shoulder. So only in understanding our duties will the exercise of our powers be fruitful. If we can serve our nation with this knowledge and in this spirit, then even brighter future awaits our country. It is my fervent prayer that through the Constitution, we will, with our body, our speech and mind, work with complete com commitment and conviction as we strengthen the sovereignty and the security of Bhutan seek your blessing of liberty, ensure justice and peace, and, en and enhance the unity and happiness of all Bhutanese, now and always. Lastly, this constitution was placed, placed before the people of the 20 Zongkoks by the king. Each word has earned its sacred place with the blessings of every citizen in our nation. This is the people's contribution. And I quote, I unquote. So I think that this particular constitution, this document is a gift it is a blessing from our kings. It is a blessing from each and every citizen of Bhutan. And we should always keep that in our mind. Thank you so much, Sangye, for your valuable input and also for sharing the very profound quote. It certainly gave us a deeper understanding of and appreciation for our constitution. And uh, while we're on the topic of uh, the historical significance, I also wanted to ask you about the origin of the process of impeachment. So could you kindly share about that as well? So impeachment, basically in Bhutanese context, it is a critical mechanism wherein the legislature, they remove individuals holding constitutional offices. So basically they are 
subject to impeachment if they are proven guilty on the grounds of serious misconduct. So these principles of checks and balances, we can see this in Article 21, Section 15 of the Constitution of Bhutan, which ensures the independence of the drunkens of the Supreme Court and the drunkens of the High Court, while also allowing for censure and suspension under specific circumstances. And uh, if I were to talk about the origin of the concept of impeachment, it has its historical roots in the 14th century, and it's England, I believe. So it initially emerged as a means of you know, initiating criminal proceedings based on the public's outcry. So there were some notable instances as well, such as the good parliament in the 14th century, and I believe it is marked as a, a great transformation era wherein such concept of impeachment was um, changed from the criminal proceedings to a form of trial. And this concept of impeachment saw periods of use and periods of decline with its revival in the 17th century, I believe, wherein they wanted to remove some of the unwanted and unpopular ministers. So that's just how the concept of impeachment came about. Um, to add on to what Sange has just stated, we can look into the jurisdiction of the United States of America, um, particularly because there are a few cases that could be cited. Um, first case is uh, in 1968, President Andrew Johnson was impeached, following which um, in 1974, President Richard Nixon was voted to be impeached. However, he, was, um, resi he resigned before the proceedings happened. And after that, President Bill Clinton also was impeached. And the most recent case that can be cited is that of President Donald Trump. He was impeached twice, that is in 2019 and 2021. However, in both cases, he was acquitted by the Senate, which means he wasn't really removed from his office. But we can look into these cases for reference with regard to the United States. Thank you so much, both of you, Sangeet, for sharing the information and Tashi for supplementing. And Tasha, I think I found it very interesting when you provided real life examples of impeachment that happened in the States, such as the impeachment proceedings for Pre President Johnson, President Nixon and President Trump. And in line with this, I had a question which I was very curious about. So in 2021, we had a case where we had a Supreme Court justice and a district court judge who were removed because they had criminal proceedings going on. And as far as I recall, there were a lot of public debate regarding the legality of the suspension. So uh, could you comment on the constitutionality of the suspension? Because I believe it concerned, the debate concerned some aspects of impeachment as well. So could you comment on that? Um, yes, like Zhang, you're right. Um, there has been a lot of legal discourse on this particular subject matter whereby legal professionals aren't able to come to an agreement whether this particular aspect is constitutional or not, whereby some of the lawyers argue that the justice should have been impeached and after impeachment and after losing his own constitutional office, he would have become a normal citizen or an ordinary citizen of the country and thereby could have been prosecuted. However, the prosecutors also argue that it is legal to have prosecuted the justice, even though he is a of constitutional office holder, mainly because he has conducted some criminal offenses and prosecuting isn't illegal in this matter. So, however, there is no correct answer as to whether impeachment should have been done or not. But according to the constitution, as he is a constitutional office holder, um, it should have been right to have conducted the impeachment proceedings. So Sange, I'm sure our audience is very interested to know who all are the relevant authorities involved in the impeachment proceedings. So could you kindly tell us who the relevant authorities are? So the relevant authorities and institutions would be first the parliament, then second would be the Supreme Court of, sorry, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Bhutan. And then the third would be the senior most strong of the Supreme Court. Okay, thank you so much, Sange. Uh, could you also elaborate on the roles of these authorities? I'm sure. So the impeachment process, so basically this impeachment proceedings, such matters is handled by the parliament with the chief justice presiding over the proceedings. And I've seen some individuals expressing their concerns 
when it comes to the Chief Justice's role in this process. Um, but then I think that it is important to note that as Chief Justice uh, is, a, is a professional figure, is a neutral figure without any political biases, without any perceived biases. So it would be better for him to preside over such proceedings. He is expert in these legal matters. He understands the nuances between the procedural justice, adjudication, and fairness. So in the case of impeachment of the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Bhutan, then the role of the senior most trumpet of the Supreme Court comes into play in this matter, um, which is sort of contrary to what certain individuals say wherein they state that the speaker should preside over such proceedings to avoid conflict of interest. However, the same reason as I stated before, the senior most strong pen of the Supreme Court is a, is a neutral figure. They are uh, experts in these legal matters. Moreover, it is a universal practice for the senior most strong pen of the Supreme Court to preside over such proceedings in the absence of the Chief Justice of the town. So these are the rules of these relevant authorities and institutions. So now that we know about the relevant authorities involved in the impeachment proceedings, uh, Tashi, could you enlighten us on the uh, office holders that are vulnerable or that are subject to impeachment? Because I'm sure uh, there are many office holders in Bhutan, but I'm sure not all of them would be subject to the impeachment process. So could you tell our audience and our viewers who all these people are? For this regard, we have to refer to Article 31.2 of the Constitution, whereby it it has been listed who the constitutional office holders are. The first one is the Chief Justice of Bhutan and the Drunkpins of the Supreme Court. The second is the Chief Justice and the Drunkpins of the High Court. Thirdly is the Chief Election Commissioner. And fourth uh, is the Auditor General. And fifth one is the Chairperson of the Royal Civil Service Commission. And lastly, the Chairperson of the Anti-Corruption Commission of Bhutan. The constitutional offices is one of the ways the government maintains checks and balances is a one of the uh, many ways that the powers have been balanced um, with regard to constitutional offices it has been enshrined in the constitution explicitly so that the people with power or the authorities do not have any hand in increasing or decreasing constitutional offices as they want to they cannot increase it just because to accommodate their needs and they cannot decrease the office holders for uh, marginalizing them and it is a very important process and a very important concept in the constitution itself. Uh, Satashi uh, you just told us about the office holders that are vulnerable for impeachment proceedings right so could you also tell us what are the legal grounds for initiating an impeachment proceeding against any of these constitutional office holder? Um, with this regard, we refer to Article 32.2 of the Constitution of the Kingdom of Bhutan, um, whereby it states that a constitutional office holder is liable for impeachment on three grounds, that is incapacity, incompetency, and lastly, serious misconduct. And this should have been in concurrence with the votes from the parliament of not less than two thirds of the total number of members. Um, the constitutional office holders must not be removed easily because it creates a hindrance in um, performing their duties and responsibilities. So even though there is a provision for impeachment, they should not be misused by removing them as they please by, because the constitutional office holders holds public accountability and not private interest. So these are the three grounds on which they can be impeached. Uh, so Tashi, you mentioned the three criteria for impeachment proceedings to be initiated against a constitutional office holder. And I believe that incapacity and incompetence are rather clear. But could you tell us more about uh, serious misconduct and how it has been defined in the constitution, if there's any definition? Um, the term misconduct, serious misconduct, is very vague and this is one of the reasons why the public or the legal professionals aren't able to come to an agreement whether there should be an impeachment or there shouldn't there should be prosecution because it has not been explicitly mentioned in the constitution where um, it is hard to discern what constitutes a serious misconduct it can be um, 
non-adherence to constitutional duties or other criminal offenses but um, all in all it is a very vague and unclear concept so uh, unfortunately we are now running out of time and we'll now have our final question and uh, this goes out to Sangye. Uh, so Sangye, can you tell us if there are any real world examples of impeachment proceedings here in Bhutan and if so can you tell us what we can learn from them now this is an interesting question and i'll tell you why um we have three justices two from the high court one from the supreme court and this particular aspect has been touched by Tashi in her earlier response um, these three justices they were removed by the judiciary without any impeachment proceedings so they were removed on the grounds of serious misconduct so these three justices they were removed without any formal impeachment proceedings which is contrary to the uh, principles outlined in the constitution regarding this matter and when we consider the historical context it becomes even more significant wherein uh, during the public consultation with the people of Punaka and Baro in the year 2005, His Majesty the Fourth Trugyalpo, he explained the importance of the inclusion of um, impeachment in the constitution. He highlighted that the, the people who are holding the constitutional offices, uh, if they indulge themselves in the criminal activities or if they violate laws exceeding their um, privileges and exceeding their power, then they should be subject to impeachment by the majority of the parliament, not by the king, not by the prime minister. So the key idea is to maintain checks and balances. The constitutional officer, office holders, they should possess sufficient authority and sufficient responsibility to function independently without any fear, or without any favor. So without such powers, they won't be able to serve the country with, um, they won't be able to serve the country that effectively. So in essence, the constitutional office holders, they are only accountable or they are only answerable to the parliament, which holds the sole prerogative to impeach them. So the bottom line is there are no real world examples of the impeachment proceedings in Bhutan as such provisions have never been exercised till now. Thank you, Sangye. And uh, Tashi, if there are any uh, concluding remarks that you'd like to make, before we conclude the session. As a law student, and after knowing that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and the Supreme Court being the guardian and the final interpreter of the Constitution, I personally feel that the impeachment process uh, of judges or whoever, the constitutional office holders, is a very interesting topic worthy of academic research, and we look forward to such legal discourses in the future. Thank you so much, Tashi, for your concluding remarks. Unfortunately, this brings us to the end of our first ever episode of our JSW Lawcast series, but I hope that our audience had as much fun as I did while learning about the impeachment process here in Bhutan. Moreover, I hope that the discussion does not just end here, and I hope that our first ever Lawcast episode serves as an impetus for all of us to engage in more meaningful discourse, especially regarding similar topics. I hope that all of us as citizens of Bhutan will strive, will always strive towards upholding the rule of law. Thank you Sangye and Tashi for your time and input. And to our dear audience, thank you all for being a part of our first ever episode. Do join us for our next episode of the JSW Lawcast, Talk Beyond the Books. See you next time.